following program is for training purposes in TV news education. Some copyrighted material is used and is credited on screen. However, no more was taken than was necessary to tell the story of the event. YBA claims fair use of materials. I don't have uh, any uh, evidence to suggest that uh, he did anything that was uh, considered outside the, the lines of, uh, of uh, appropriate behavior. However, when you sit back and look at a guy with a 17-year career in a high collision position like that, um, it, it, it would be an extremely unique individual to be able to play at that intensity level that for that many, that number of years uh, and not use uh, whatever would be at his disposal to make sure that he can be back on the field and play. Now, I do a lot of public speaking and, uh, and frankly, get the question routinely, did you use steroids? You know, did you use performance enhancing uh, drugs when you played? My answer generally is that you're asking the wrong question. The question should be, had I thought I needed something to help me play better and stay in the league, would I have used it? That's probably a better question, don't you think? And in, in at the answer, it, it, I would probably say yes, I probably would have done whatever I needed to do to stay in the game, which speaks to the mentality of, of the player. However, um, much of what these guys are putting themselves through, they're essentially they're lab rats. They're dealing with, uh, they're experimenting with very dangerous uh, uh, toxins that don't have, that have certainly have an, an immediate effect in, in terms of uh, performance enhancement, but also a long-term effect, which is, which is translating to shortened lifespans. The mortality rates are relatively low, and there's a lot of reasons behind it. And abuse, self-abuse, uh, uh, while playing, um, experimenting on yourself, uh, is, a, is a major issue uh, that now we're just beginning to see the kind of the, 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 the byproduct of that behavior 20, 25 years ago. So keep an eye on Ray Lewis. See if he lives to be, lives, lives to be 70 years old. I don't know. But uh, uh, I would suggest that it, having the kind of career he had and the position that he's played, um, he would have, in having some vague understanding of his personality, I would suggest that you know, he's probably done some things to stay in the game that um, he can live with. Yeah, so moving on now to one of the biggest storylines of the entire Super Bowl is the two coaches. In case you haven't heard, they are brothers. Jim Harbaugh, coach of the 49ers, and John Harbaugh, coach of the Ravens. And in honor of that, we have put together a list of some of the best brother duos in, and sister duos in all of sports. So starting it off, we have Eli and Peyton Manning. Eli has two Super Bowl rings. Unfortunately, both of them were defeating the New England Patriots. And Peyton Manning, he has one Super Bowl ring with the Colts, and he led the, uh, led the Denver Broncos this year to 13 straight victories, the top seed in the AFC and winning the AFC West division. And also, I just want to throw in here, Serena and Venus Williams. Uh, Serena has 47 singles titles and is number two in the world right now. Venus is number 23 in the world. So we're going to send it over and out to Dylan and Aman with some of their top brother and sister duos in sports. Um, well, some you might not know, um, the Gronkowski brothers, there's actually three Gronkowskis in the NFL and a fourth one coming up. Pretty, pretty athletic family. And we all know Gronkowski as the raw Gronkowski as the major one, but also his brother's a fullback, I think, for the Cowboys. So um, that's, that's another multiple brothers in the, in the NFL. Dylan, you have anything you want? No. No? <laughs> well, uh, well, I remember one more. The Molinas in baseball. Yadier Molina is a catcher for the Angels. Is also, he played on the Texas, there's Molina on the Texas Rangers and on the Cardinals. And um, yeah, three Molina brothers, both present, all, all three present in the MLB right now. So it's pretty, pretty impressive for the Molina family. Yeah, and a few more that I want to throw in. The uh, Sedin brothers, it's Daniel and Henrik. They are both on the Vancouver Canucks. And also you have, in the NBA, you have Brooke and Robin Lopez. Brooke is on the Brooklyn Nets, and Robin Lopez is on New Orleans Hornets. And then, of 
course, everyone knows Pau Gasol of the Lakers and Marc Gasol of the Grizzlies. Pau Gasol is averaging about 13 points per game. Uh, Marc Gasol averaging about 14 points per game. And, and uh, going back to the Sedins, only eight games played for the Canucks because of the NHL lockout. Daniel Sedin, two goals and four assists. Henrik Sedin has not put the puck in the net, but he has assisted on five goals for the uh, Canucks. Do you got, uh, Peter, do you have any ones that you can think of? Yeah, you, you stole all my thunder, my man. I mean, you took all the good ones, the more, the more obvious ones, but it does speak to uh, the uh, gene pools, strong gene pool. Having an older brother or an older sister who's gone through it, if you got the skill, uh, they can bring you right along and show, show you what, what to do and what to avoid. And I, I think that, that speaks to some of these. We have two and three siblings in, in, similar, in, in leagues. The Gronkowski's a great story. Now that's, those guys, I don't want to get in a tang with those guys at late night in some bar room somewhere. I'll be on their side if you catch my drift. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move on to a live shot with Larson. He's at the stadium bar uh, with some fans getting ready uh, for the Super Bowl. Larson, take it away. Hello, and welcome to the stadium in Waltham. I'm here to discuss the consumerism in the Super Bowl, and here to discuss it with me is bartender of the stadium, Emily. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure thing. So my first question for you is, are you going to be watching the Super Bowl tonight? Absolutely, definitely. So you're going to be one of the 179 million people expected to be watching the Super Bowl. I actually have a bunch of statistics here that I want to list off quickly. Um, just to discuss the, the vastness of the Super Bowl that people don't really think about. So we will be consuming 1.2 billion chicken wings, 19 million slices of pizza, 79 million avocados, 50 million cases of beer, 7.5 million households are planning to buy a new TV, and the tickets are going to cost up to $157 million in total. And the whole affair will cost about uh, $12.3 billion, everything in the Super Bowl. Now, uh, speaking of business, that's quite a lot of money. Um, will the stadium be getting a lot of business tonight for the Super Bowl? Absolutely. I mean, I think that we get a good crowd anyway for, for regular football games, but the Super Bowl is such a big event, such a like one of the most nationally televised, like popular events. So, I mean, people always want to come eat wings. We have specials. We have a lot of beer. So people love to come here. Yeah, we'll definitely get a good crowd for sure. Sure. Um, now, how do you prepare for the Super Bowl? Because it's, it's going to be such a big event here at the stadium, I assume. How do you like get ready for all the people, all the food, all the drink? Um, well, we definitely ordered a lot more nachos, a lot more wings, stuff like that, like football picky foods. And then for beer, you know, to make sure that all our kegs are stocked, all the coolant is, uh, or the, excuse me, the walk-ins full of cold beer, because we're going to sell a lot of bottles, a lot of draft beer. So make sure all the fruit's cut and just, you know, be ready to serve. Yeah. Um, so uh, what are you expecting for tonight if it will be, you know, really busy? Are you expecting to have crowd control in here? What, what's going on? Well, we have Scott. He's, um, I mean, I could be security if I wanted, but I'm not very tall. So Scott back there, he's a pretty big guy. So if there's any fights, he'll definitely take care of him. But usually in here, you know, we get, we'll get a lot of screaming and yelling, but it's good screaming and yelling because it's football and everyone likes to scream yeah. at the TV during football. So. Definitely. Now, uh, do you have a team you're rooting for? Any? Well, since the Patriots aren't in it, I guess if I had to root for a team, I would guess I would root for the 49ers just because they, just because the Ravens beat us. So, but in <laughs> retrospect, like, yeah. Patriots vengeance. Yeah, right. <laughs> So I'll thank you for tuning in. I'm Larson, live at the stadium in Waltham. Thank you for joining me, Emily. Thank you for having me. And back to you, Jason. All right. Thank you, Larson, for that. That was great. And I guess with all those people eating the chicken wings and pizza, we'll see hopefully a lot of people at the gym tomorrow. All right. We're going to take a break, but stick around because we'll talk about we'll talk college hoops when we come back. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to K Sports Sunday. I'm Jason here with Iman, Dylan, and Peter Cronin, our very special guest. So we're going to talk some college basketball. Indiana, number three, beat uh, the top team in the nation, Michigan, 83-71 to in Assembly Hall. We're going to send it over to Dylan and Iman to talk about that game. 
Yeah, I think, to be honest, I think I, I was kind of expecting Indiana to win. You know, if you're number three, hosting number one team at home, you know, teams at home normally win, and number three, you know, so I was kind of expecting that Indiana preseason number one, they'll probably be number one again now with Kansas losing. And plus, that was a big win to beat Michigan. Michigan and Indiana are definitely the big, best teams in the Big Ten at, at this point. What about you? Yeah, you know, um, Indiana totally dominated, really dominated that game. We made their first six shots, and it just spiraled up from there. Uh, this they won by was 83-71 yeah, by yeah. 12 points, but it was really no, no, no. I think it was like 81. 81, 73. Excuse me, it won by nine points, but it seemed like a, a bigger margin, you know. But also a lot of other ranked, important ranked games. NC State and Miami. Miami getting a game-winning tip in with 0.8 seconds left. I mean, just. Pretty sensational game, you know. Yeah. I mean, Miami is eight and zero in ACC play, and all the other teams in a the ACC have two plus losses, including okay. Duke, North Carolina. Oh yeah, in the ACC though, I'm I'm quite impressed because all the teams I feel can beat anyone. Miami's eight and zero, but they only beat Boston College, two and six ACC team by one point. So you don't know. All the teams in the ACC are good. Miami, they they're, they're a good team, but they they. They struggled in some of the games that they are expected to win, like they lose to Florida Gulf Coast by eight. I don't even know if you know about Florida Gulf Coast, but they lost them by eight. Duke struggling, they lost to NC State and Miami. I think NC State and Miami could actually for real make a run in the tournament. They they got the talent to win it all. I'm not saying that they are, but they could, you know. And and even and Clemson was one of those teams. They beat Virginia by 15. They're like a middle of the pack ACC team, so. They lost yesterday, so that kind of ruined their NCAA tournament home. Virginia, that's another team. No one talks about them. They, but they're 5-2 they're and two in the ACC. They beat North Carolina. They could really, they're, they're a sleeper in the ACC. They could contend too. So. Yeah, and with the conference realignments, you're going to have Syracuse, Pittsburgh, and Louisville all moving to the ACC. So the ACC tournament's going to be very interesting with Louisville, Duke, UNC, NC State, Miami getting into the mix now. You mentioned Virginia. The ACC is very close. Everyone's been talking about the Big Ten with Michigan, Indiana, Minnesota, uh, even Iowa and Illinois and Wisconsin, Ohio State, Michigan State. But the ACC is another big conference to watch. So Syracuse lost by 10 to Pittsburgh. Now that is their second straight loss. They just lost to Villanova. Dylan, what's going on with Syracuse? Syracuse, I mean, you know, it's the middle of the season, so teams, sometimes they might not take the games like that seriously. You know, it's like, oh, it's the middle of the season. All we really care about is making the NCAA tournament. Once we get there, that's when we'll make a run. You know, if you lose a few games here and there, doesn't exactly matter, but you just have, as long if you're like a top seed in the tournament, that's what's really going to matter. So Syracuse, they're still going to be fine. The defense, though, but, it, but they still got to, it's just they need to do well in the regular season and know how to do well once the tournament comes. Yeah, I'm sure, but I'm sure Jim Boheim will get, get his team back on the right track. He's such a great coach. He's going to, he's a legendary coach, or second all time yeah, for so, wins, yeah. and uh, he's going to fix this team up straight, and he's going to have them prepared for the NCAA tournament.